Postcolonial translation is a remarkable anthology assembles distinguished scholars from diverse regions, Britain, the US, Brazil, India, and Canada to explore pivotal intersections between postcolonial theory and translation studies by scrutinizing the dynamics between language and authority across cultural frontiers. This compilation unveils the crucial function of translation in reshaping the connotations of culture and ethnic heritage. The essays cover a range of topics, including connections between core and periphery in the transmission of ideas, transformations in translation practices from colonial to post-colonial societies, the role of translation in power dynamics within Indian languages, the application of Brazilian cannibalistic theories in the transfer of literary work works. In the first essay of Basnad and Trivedi's collection, titled Post-Colonial Writing and Literary Translation Maria Tomachko draws a parallel between literary translation and post-colonial writing. She argues that translators transpose a text, while post-colonial writers transpose a culture both engaging in intercultural expression. Despite differing constraints in presenting cultural elements, Tomachko contends that these disparities are more apparent than substantive. Much like literary translations tend to be simpler than their source texts, postcolonial authors necessarily simplify the cultural contexts they depict. Both processes involve unavoidable selectivity and interpretation with room for lexical perturbations influenced by the source language or culture. Postcolonial literature often explicitly provides cultural information, akin to translations. Tomachko also delves into considerations of patronage, audience, and the shared characteristics between postcolonial and minority culture writing. While not always universally persuasive or productive, this initial essay's thesis sets the stage for the subsequent chapters. G.J.V. Prasid in writing translation. The strange case of the Indian English novel further explores this idea within the Indian context. He posits that all Indian English writers engage in a form of translation through their writing process. Their objective is not to replicate the specific features of English spoken in their depicted regions, but to create an English that aligns with their translational creative goals. Prasad analyzes lexical choices in works by writers like Mulk Raj Anand, R.K. Narayan, Babhani Bhattacharya, Raja Rao's Kanthapura, and Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children. These writers employ various strategies to imbue their works with a translational quality occupying a space between Anglo-American English and Indian culture. Sherry Simon's translating an interlingual creation in the contact zone. Border writing in Quebec shifts the focus to Quebec. Here, writing and translation converge as practices of creation in the contact zone between cultures. Simon contends that the role of the translator is no longer exclusive. It overlaps with that of the writer and the contemporary Western citizen, as well as many bilingual individuals in colonized nations. She examines the works of Jacques Brault, Nicole Brossard, and Daniel Gagnon to illustrate how language contact and translation become generative forces in literary creation. Simon concludes that our current understanding of translation emphasizes discontinuity friction, and multiplicity, rather than the creation of new commonalities. André Lefevier's Compassing the Other presents a theoretical framework for approaching translation. Lefevier argues that translators primarily engage with two interconnected grids, the conceptual and the textual, rather than focusing solely on the linguistic level of individual words and phrases. Both the original writer and the translator grapple with these grids, seeking to manipulate them in ways that not only facilitate communication, but also make it engaging and appealing. 
Through a detailed examination of three Dutch texts centered on Dutch India, now Indonesia, Lefevere illustrates how the interplay of these grids shapes the reader's perception of reality in both the translation and the original. The other contributions in the volume largely follow the pattern of drawing general insights from specific examples, which may be considered somewhat specialized. For instance, Else Ribeiro Pires Vieira explores Geraldo de Campos's Poetics of Transcreation, specifically within the context of the digestive metaphor in Brazil. This leads her to the conclusion that cannibalism, initially a rebellious linguistic tool and form of resistance, resurfaces in the 1960s and 1970s as both a cultural metaphor and philosophy. Vinay Darwidkar delves into A.K. Ramanujan's theory and practice of translation, while Rosemary Arojo's interpretation as possessive love, Helene Sixis, Clarice Lispector and the ambivalence of fidelity scrutinizes Sixus's advocacy of Lispector's work, ultimately arguing that Sixus's feminist interpretation may inadvertently perpetuate a form of colonization, shifting grounds of exchange. B. M. Srikantaya and Kannada translation by Vanamala Viswanatha and Sherry Simon examines the work of writer and translator Srikantaya, 1884-1946, in the context of Indian literature and translation, as well as the broader scope of literary translation in Canada. The authors assert that translation practice is inseparable from a theory of culture, reflecting the evolving power dynamics that influence and uphold national and cultural boundaries. Ganesh Devi's translation and literary history, an Indian view takes a broader perspective, briefly discussing European approaches to translation studies and proposing that an exploration of the translating consciousness, particularly in regions dominated by a colonial language, can yield a theory of interlingual synonymy and a more insightful literary historiography. Devi also contends that Indian literary theory places greater emphasis on the writer's ability to transform translate and revitalize the original, framing Indian literary traditions as fundamentally rooted in translation. As evident from the discussions above, several recurring themes permeate this collection. These include the parallels drawn between literary translation and post-colonial writing, the act of appropriation and colonization of the source text through translation, often likened to cannibalism, and the emergence of a novel. Hybrid language is a consequence of translation within the post-colonial context. Lefevere's essay, situated in a colonial backdrop, stands out for its innovative theoretical approach, one that could potentially be applied beyond the realm of translation to various forms of writing. The case studies presented illustrating how translation has been utilized in diverse cultural settings prompt a critical question that, regrettably, remains unaddressed in these essays. What is the translator's role in relation to both the source and target cultures in the post-colonial context? Moreover, though only implicitly touched upon here, it raises the question of whether post-colonial translation studies should differentiate between the direction of the translation developing distinct theoretical frameworks for a. translations from the dominant language into the colonized language, and b. vice versa. The metaphor of cannibalism extends to both the source text and the standard language. Several essays underscore the assimilation of the source text and culture, as well as the dominant target language, resulting in the creation of a hybrid, intermediary language that bridges the two cultures much like colonized individuals themselves. The potential for such hybrid languages is indeed intriguing. However, in regions like India, where the privileging of the standard language is deeply ingrained, 
Envisioning widespread acceptance and equality between these hybrids and standard English remains a challenging prospect.